to Mahala Foresight, and this is Mikhail Manasseh, producer and host of the show. Uh, today, we are connected via Skype to the US for an interview with Professor Hezkel Gabisa, distinguished scholar and uh, public intellectual. Uh, Professor Hezkel, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, to start with, would you help us make out the political landscape in the country and the forces shaping its contours? Uh, I mean, this is a, a changing environment all the time that uh, the political landscape changes from time to time. But at the moment, I think the country is in the throes of a struggle, a bitter struggle between two forces. Historically rooted, but shaped by events and processes uh, over time. Uh, today, I think the main political confrontation in the country is between forces that have historic, historically uh, uh, been shaped by the two main questions of the Ethiopian political landscape. That is the uh, question of economic justice and the right of nations and nationalities. There are federalist forces, multinational federalist forces, people who believe that the rights of nations and nationalities and peoples as enshrined in the constitution of the country should be respected and that these uh, the the constitutional order that is undergirded by that constitution should be respected as well uh, and forces that have that are we thought that were really dead uh, and gone um, have resurrected themselves and presented themselves as the saviors of the country uh, but the direction that they are shown as is to go backwards to the uh, unitary state uh, that is um, that was under uh, the imperial system and uh, uh, ruled by an all powerful uh, monarch. Uh, so basically, these are the two shapes that the multinational constitutionalist uh, and democratic forces and the resurrected warmed over um, uh, unitarists, uh, undemocratic and um, um, uh, unconstitutional forces. That's basically the landscape uh, uh, or the forces that are uh, confronting each other today. So how has uh, Abiy's group uh, responded to the demands of the people, uh, the Ethiopian peoples so far since it came to power? That's that's very clear. Uh, it's been two years and we have seen uh, the programs, we have seen the speeches, we have seen the uh, accomplishments. Uh, he's completely ignored the demands of the people. Look, in Ethiopia, there are basically three demands of all the people. We know that there are nations and nationalities and peoples in Ethiopia with different aspirations, with different historical grievances. But if you really want to sum it up, that, that, that could be subsumed under three main headings. One is the democratic demand of self-government. The other is um, economic justice, that people in uh, nationalities and nations should be able to benefit from economic growth and the resources of their region. And third, that there, there should be cultural equality, no one should be superior to other. Those are basically the political, economic, and cultural questions. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, the former Prime Minister, to be sure, uh, has never wanted to respond to these questions. He had a very different priorities and different agendas that he really wanted to resurrect the mystical Ethiopia that he says were, was mentioned uh, in the in the Bible for 300, more than 360 times. Uh, that for him, that Ethiopia is a unified state. The people uh, are uh, in harmony. Only the politicians uh, that have uh, arisen from time to time have disturbed the political order. So he really wanted to uh, create a unitarist, monarchic Ethiopia that, that did not want to pay attention to what the people have to say. This is why we say that it is a, an undemocratic uh, government that he had presided over, that he had no wish to respond to the people of uh, uh, the country. In fact, he's, he, he looks at these demands with disdain that these were not appropriate, that, his, um, that the people love each other, people are just, people are in harmony. It is the politicians that have arisen over the last 50, 40 years that have disturbed the political order in the country. So he has, it's not that he has not responded. He has no wish uh, of responding to the demands of the people that I outlined earlier. 
So the opposition political forces uh, have been demanding, you know, uh, an all-inclusive dialogue. How will this bring the country out of the uh, current crisis that it is in? Look, the crisis in the country is the making of one man. The making of one man. There is a clear direction for this country that has unfolded over the last 50 years. As I say, there were two major political questions. It's not three that, as, as, he, as he recently claimed in a, a video that, is, um, that he was lecturing his political party. There are mainly two questions. Uh, one is of, of uh, uh, economic justice uh, that was encapsulated in the motto of the land through the tiller. And the other is a question of equality in, in the country, that this country should be a country of citizens, but not of lords and, uh, and serfs. These are the main questions. They are basically economic and cultural. The political demand is a matter of representation to resolve these two main issues. Uh, but he has a different agenda, different priorities. Um, he wants to be a monarch, an all-powerful monarch. That's the problem. Now, how do we get out of that? The simple answer is to remove him from power. He is unfit to be the leader of 110 million people, completely devoid and bereft of any capacity to lead this country. He is interested in other things than the main demands of, uh, of the, the people. Look what he was doing yesterday, that by beautifying the city of Addis Ababa, he thinks that he could respond to the, the country's needs by simply planting trees over here and over there, that he thinks that this is the results in prosperity for all. Look, <clears throat> In the past uh, 50 years, the, the direction of development or economic justice in the country was not from cities to countryside. It was from the countryside to the cities. He has it in reverse order. And as long as he, is, he presides over, his vision is so contorted, uh, he is only self-centered that he wants to use all powers to make himself happy. I mean, if, if you are really a, a powerful uh, monarch, who was benevolent, who wants to do something for the country, that would be okay. We can live under that one too. But this is a man that is so self-centered, so narcissist, that anything that he has or anything that he does is to make him happy for the day. That's what, that's the problem. How do you get out of that? It's basically by removing him from, from power. He is totally incapable of leading this country. That's the simple answer. Now, the political question that you're asking is that all forces, all stakeholders in that country should come together. This is the country of 150 million people with different interests, with different visions, with colliding uh, 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 dreams, as uh, Professor Marara says. It's a very complicated country. The vision of one man cannot lead the country out of the abysmal situation that it is in. It's impossible. Governing is not about dictating. Governing is about harmonizing interests, very different interests. It is to make sure that people actually are living in tolerance of each other. That's what governing is. But his view of governing is to dictate, to tell people what to do and live according to his uh, desire. The political forces in the country with these different visions and different interests should sit around a table and then negotiate a way out. Uh, that's the only thing that is done. But you know that there is a constitutional crisis. We are in the midst of it. We're in the throes of a constitutional crisis right now. What I am taking is the political side of it. The political side of it is that we all of the, the people in that country should take stock of our situation but make sure that without negotiations uh, and take give and take, there is no way forward. Uh, Dr. Abi has repeatedly claimed that he is a champion of Ethiopia's unity and prosperity. Uh, does that tally with the reality on the ground? That's not politics. See, that's not politics. Who doesn't want prosperity? Could that be it's something that distinguishes you as a political force, that you are for prosperity and someone is not for prosperity? That's not politics. Okay, All of us, I mean, all political forces would want to have prosperity. The difference is how to get there. 
understand the human condition. We're not the same. So that's not politics. That's an infantile disorder. Uh, I cannot say that, that this is uh, this is politics or unity of the country. Who doesn't want the unity of the country? Who wants the, to sell the country to another country? That's not politics. That's not how political uh, po politics is arranged in that country. And that's what I was uh, referring to when I say that only a tunnel vision of an inept and incompetent person cannot be the basis for political negotiations. We are past the era of the dictator. We are past the era of the monarch. Look, in the country, in Ethiopia, 40 or 50 years ago, there was a consensus. Monarchy is not what we want. Uh, unity on the, base, uh, on the basis that uh, uh, ignores diversity is, is unsustainable. There was a unity on that one. So what we need in that country is not the way he defines unity. It's a unity of purpose that the country needs. Humans, humans cannot agree on just one thing unless that is a dictator that is trying to dictate his own will to the other people. But that's a violation of human rights. That you take out the will of the people and dictate your own will or impress your own will on others. That cannot be sustained. So the way he talks about unity or territorial integrity is not what we need. What we need is a unity of purpose as enshrined in the Ethiopian constitution of creating a political and economic uh, community. That's what we want, a unity of purpose. It's not to harmonize this different uh, interest, interest and visions. It's not to tell people what to be and what to do. So his version, is not even politics. It cannot be even dignified with the idea that this is politics. As I said, this is about governance. It's about living together. It's about tolerance. It's about uh, unity of purpose. Not nobody. Nobody can say that I don't want uh, 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 prosperity. That's that's everybody wants prosperity. It's how to get to that prosperity or how you define prosperity. What is Mr. Abe's uh, prosperity? One, it's imagination. I didn't make this up. He said it. He said it repeatedly. If you imagine, it happens. Sounds like a gospel which says that if you imagine and claim it, you can have it. Claim it and have it. That's his vision of, of prosperity. But that's not prosperity. That requires hard work. Hard work. A deep thinking about how to uh, how to how to divide that. Uh, 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 divvy up the, the growth uh, that is in the country. That's not, his vision is not, let me, I've repeated myself so much, but it's not politics. I cannot say that it is a, it's politics. Uh, the, the group in power's response uh, so far to the call for national dialogue has not been in the affirmative. So what next? What happens if the group in power now persists on ruling, putting almost all opposition uh, leaders behind bars? I guess, again, that's we have been through that at different points in the country's history. We have been through that. The day of the dictator is over, not only in Ethiopia, but also globally. There are international norms here, um, but the current trajectory where, where the, the, the aspiring potentate uh, says that this is what I want for the country, I want to resurrect this mystical Ethiopia, is unsustainable. This is a country that is urbanized, educated. It's a country not, not of uh, the 50 years ago where the majority were even not literate. It's a different country. So if we do not sit down together and, for, and uh, frame um, uh, a way forward, that trajectory is a disastrous conflict that will culminate in a calamitous political implosion. And the implosion isn't... Um, isn't going to be self-contained. It will have severe repercussions and reverberation, uh, reverberations in the entire Horn of Africa. Abiy Ahmed, uh, after postponing or cancelling the elections, has recently said that it's possible to hold elections while taking precautions against the virus. Uh, what do you respond to that? Well, uh, I'm glad that he came to that idea that it is possible to to safe uh, to conduct elections safely uh, and by protecting the health of the people. Now, 
that that's not something that he desired that it is the election that was uh, conducted in in tigray that forced this reality to dawn on him that it is possible to do that uh, and that kind of disturbed his uh, political program in which he will eliminate all opposition forces and conduct the postponed election indefinitely that was his goal uh, but the election in, in, in tigray uh, disturbed the program for him um, showed to the world that it is possible to hold elections. But the, the kind of elections that he is planning uh, is not what we're waiting for. It's not what is expected, and it will not solve the political problems in the country. What is Ethiopia standing in the horn uh, currently? Uh, Dr. Abiy's influence in the neighborhood. How do you assess that? Um, if you remember, sometime like 20 years ago, uh, Eritrea was Eritrea was at war with nearly all countries in the Horn, including Yemen, about 20, 20 uh, some years ago. Uh, Mr. Isaias, uh, Isaias Akhorki, is the most reviled politician on the face of the earth. Uh, uh, a, a dictator, uh, a dictator of the worst kind. Uh, that had caused the uh, about 500,000 uh, Eritreans flee the country. It's it's a country that is um, that had a promise about 30 years ago that it would become um, the Indone the the uh, Singapore of the country. It had that potential. The Eritrean people are hardworking people, um, industrious people, uh, uh, people who love their liberty and could uh, pay, are ready to pay sacrifice. Now, it, that's, the, that's Eritrea, and it was in conflict, as I said, with nearly all of the countries of the Horn. His political vision is rejected by Eritreans and by the international community. By adopting the political vision of Isaiah Zafor, Abi himself, Abi has made himself a laughing stock in the region and internationally. Now, there are a lot of things that we can say, but we don't have time about the politics and geo geopolitics in the region. But by adopting the vision of Isaiah Safaworki, who was in conflict with all of those countries of the Horn, you cannot expect Abiy Ahmed could be a respected person as a, a leader of a country, a large country in the Horn of Africa, a source of stability and inspiration for all of the countries in the Horn of Africa, he could have become a historic figure if he knew the limits of power and if he knew how to um, rein in his um, ambitions. But, but because he, he did not know that, he did not have the capacity and the wherewithal uh, to be able to see the complexities of the country uh, and the Horn, uh, Horn politics, he has dismantled all the, dismantled all the uh, relationships with, the, with uh, the countries of the Horn. He is now seen as a child, an infantile politician uh, in the country. He has made Ethiopia lose its respect in, in the Horn region. No one, and some of some of the leaders in the country uh, 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 have already said that in, in, in private, at least, that this is not what Ethiopia deserves. Uh, even the small countries uh, in the region who would not dare say anything about Ethiopia in private uh, express the view that this is not what Ethiopia deserves. This is not what is an embarrassment uh, to, to the region. That's the way uh, uh, he is viewed. And because of him, Ethiopia has lost the luster and the respect that it commands or should command in the Horn of Africa region. But he happens to be the Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureate. That's gone, by the way. So I, even, even um, the Nobel Peace Committee, the Norwegian P Nobel Peace Committee, because of the backlash, the backlash that they have received this year have decided, I hear, have decided this year that uh, to award uh, the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize, not to an individual, but uh, to the World Food Program, because they were chastised by the experience, because not even a year passed, once he took his um, uh, one million or a little bit over one million dollars in the prize and came back home, he, he embarked on a, a political trajectory that was unbecoming of a Nobel Peace Laureate, denigrating the opposition forces, 
incarcerating political opposition for uh, opposition violating human rights uh, uh, in the country in in the region becoming a destabilizing uh, force uh, in the horn of africa all of the things that they hoped for he went against so even the nobel peace prize committee that are, uh, is chastised uh, they probably were not were uh, in the very short order will not award prematurely a peace prize to uh, uh, an individual so that is the safe way to award this to award it to the world peace uh, uh, the world food program or some other maybe next year uh, after covid to the uh, uh, who that's probably safe because they were they were they will not be able to defend their record uh, because of the dec premature decision that they made uh, at the time see at the time they hoped that they would encourage him on the path of peace uh, the democratization and uh, 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 economic justice. That's what they thought. Uh, but he showed once there was a decision was made, he started flaunting um, international norms. He said he would not go to uh, Norway and would not speak to uh, uh, he would not speak to no, uh, journalists and all that. He, well, he was showing once the decision was made, he was showing his true colors, and he has made because of that he has made the Nobel Peace uh, Committee. Uh, uh, in, an embarrassment to the idea of no, uh, uh, Alfred Nobel. Now to his party. Uh, how do you describe the Prosperity Party's uh, modest operandi uh, regarding dealing with differences, uh, its approach to diversity? Uh, look, first, let's say something about the, the Prosperity Party. Parties are established, parties are created to advance a cause. They should have a coherent ideology. You don't create an organization and then try to find a mission for it. You, you have a mission and then you, have, you create an organization that would promote and implement that vision. The Prosperity Party is not a party founded to advance a cause or to implement an ideology, a political ideology. There is no coherent ideology there. As I said at the beginning, the idea of prosperity is not, is not politics. It cannot be an ideology. The, the notion of uh, uh, medemer or synergy or whatever they're calling it is not politics. It's, it's uh, some infantile idea. But you cannot, there is no limit to the ambition that Mr. Abi has that he, he he thought, for God's sake, he thought that he could replace liberalism, that he could liber, uh, uh, replace socialism. He said he said he could think very differently and uh, uh, than Karl Marx, a person whose name he cannot even pronounce. Now his idea, he thought, was um, some kind of a Nobel a noble idea that is uh, greater than the um, uh, the idea of uh, liberalism and communism. So, and I and I, I a party that was created on the basis of no idea basically, <laughs> no ideology cannot be sustained. Prosperity party, the prosperity party was created for only one reason. If he had remained in under in uh, in EPRDF. There is always this uh, uh, assessment that they conduct, and if he failed that assessment, he could be removed from office. That's his motivation. In order not to be assessed, he wanted to create a party that is his own making, that, uh, that he could dominate. So it was created for that purpose. It was not created for, a, for an idea, to promote an idea, or lead, lead the country to prosperity. So it cannot hold together. Prosperity is still in prosperity. There are different parties. The OPDO is still in there. The other uh, uh, parties are still in there. They are still in there. They are simply declared that they are now prosperity. Otherwise, institutions, the, uh, the, the, the personalities are all in there. Nothing changed. So as far as I'm concerned, it's not even a political party. It cannot be dignified with the political party. This is simply people who are um, uh, held together by the wish that they could, they could milk 
the Ethiopian people for their own benefit. That's as much as I could say about the party itself. The modus operandi, the modus operandi is what we have been saying. Uh, there's no respect for, for diversity. The man doesn't think that Ethiopia is diverse. He believes that Ethiopia has only one, one goal, or Ethiopians have one goal, that the people love each other, uh, they speak the same language, they have the same ideology, in fact, probably the same religion. That's the vision of Ethiopia that he has. So their modus operandi is to, to dominate, to denigrate, to imprison, to cut, uh, 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 flatten. That's, that's their view. And that's where the problem is uh, right now. They have really no modus operandi that is appropriate to the demands of the times and the demands of the people. Can we say uh, Ethiopia under Dr. Abiy Ahmed is still a federation? From his perspective, Ethiopia is not a federation. That's why he replaced he replaced uh, all the presidents of the, re the federal units. Uh, he stood in, uh, he, he stood uh, ahead of uh, or in front of the desire of the Sidama people when they voted 98.6%. He said that uh, the Sidama people have spoken that we have not we have not decided. Uh, he he is not a federalist uh, from his perspective. He's not um, uh, for federalism. He's not um, uh, for that from his perspective. But the reality on the ground is that most of the Ethiopians, all of Ethiopians, in fact, nearly all Ethiopians, uh, have this vision that Ethiopia can stay together. Uh, people could be, be become citizens of a country only if their uh, rights as a group, uh, as nations and nationalities, are uh, respected, that they are sovereign nations and nationalities who can govern themselves in their own regions. So in the southern people, uh, the nations and nationalities um, uh, region, what you see is a demand for self-governing rights, constitutionally guaranteed rights uh, with procedures. So the desire of the people is to view the country as a federation, a multinational federation, not any federation, by the way. That it is a multinational federation. That's what the, peop the people desire in Tigray, in Afar, in Somali region, in Oromia, in Gambela, in the uh, uh, Benishango region. That's what people desire. And that is what is sensible based on the historical experience of Ethiopia. Assimilation doesn't work. Unitarism doesn't work. Dictatorship doesn't work. We have seen it. We've tried it all. From his perspective, that mystical Ethiopia is probably existing in, on, in the prime minister, uh, the former prime minister's mind. But the reality on the ground is that the aspiration of the people is to live in harmony with a, a political and economic community in which people are citizens and have citizens' rights. So. The way I, I could answer your question is that the reality and the aspiration of the people is that Ethiopia is still a federation and Ethiopia could only continue as a multinational federation. Uh, but he has a different view and different priorities. Uh, and because of that, we are in a conundrum, uh, in an impossible situation uh, for the country, because this vision of one man against uh, or the versus about 90 percent of the Ethiopian population. Does that reality, does that aspiration of the people uh, show that there is still proof of life of the constitution? I don't think just because one man and his, um, his collaborators have flaunted the constitution that this living document, which is basically a consensus document of Ethiopia's peoples, uh, nations and nationalities, uh, is dead. I don't think so. Um, People remain, um, social contracts uh, are renewed and they remain, they're always uh, uh, improved. But, but the vision uh, of um, uh, 50 million people in Oromia or uh, uh, in other peoples in, in, in area could be denigrated because someone simply said that I, I don't like this thing and therefore I will foist my own idea on uh, on the entire population, the Ethiopian peoples uh, and nationalities and nations. That, that is a living document. It's a consensus document born out of the historical experience of the country that, that the idea that there is only one culture and others are assimilated into it did not bear fruit. It was tried. 
It failed disastrously. It created civil wars in the country. This is a consensus document. This is the only way that Ethiopia could stay together. It was a very civilized document. The Ethiopian constitution is, uh, is probably uh, one of the more liberal uh, constitutions that respects all kinds of individual and group rights. That cannot be dead. It cannot die because someone um, uh, who by accident uh, got to the prime minister's office uh, didn't like it. Uh, this is a dead vision that he has. It's, 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 he's trying to resuscitate it, breathe life to it. I think that's, that's dead. I think the constitution, the federation, um, they're still alive. So those who oppose uh, Abiy Ahmed's unitarist tendencies are branded by his supporters as uh, ethno-nationalist violent uh, forces who are threatening Ethiopia's unity and democracy. Are these federalist forces against unity and democracy? No, they, they are not. By the way, let me say, say this to, to those who say that the ethno-nationalist or the nationalists in the country uh, are against the, uh, um, against the unity uh, in, of our sovereignty or uh, in te territorial integrity of the country. The nationalists won against the dictator in 1991. They won. <laughs> Remember 1991. They won. They defeated that vision in the battlefield. They will do it again. No nation in Ethiopia. No nationality in Ethiopia are going to surrender, surrender the right that they have won. Maybe what we should say is that multinational federalism in 1991 saved Ethiopia from disintegration. The, the promise, the promise that this country would be for what would become. A, 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 a country of willing nations and nationalities is what saved the country from disintegration. Try something else that didn't work under Mangistu Haile Mariam and Haile, uh, 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 the imperial system. It didn't work. Then the nationalists won. And they put in place uh, a framework in which liberty, equality, human rights are respected. What happened afterwards is, and for understandable reasons, that the, the federation was not uh, democratized and imp implemented in a democratic way. And from 2014-2018, again, the nationalists, like the Cairo and others in uh, other regions, they won against the dictatorship. <laughs> they won, remember that. They won using uh, peaceful means. They're still there. The nationalists are a positive for good. Nationalists are a force for good in the country, for justice in the country, for liberty, for human dignity in the country. How could that be against Ethiopia? If they are, if they are, how, why is that that they, they held this country together for uh, nearly 30 years? Now, this is not acceptable. I, only I want to remind, remind them that if you push if you push the nationalists the way you are right now, the result would be total dissolution of the country. I think the, the thing that we should do is that democratization has unleashed some forces that uh, we thought were dead. But that doesn't mean that they're going, to, they're going to prevail over the wishes of the nations and the nationalities and the peoples of Ethiopia. The nationalists, the nationalists have won in the last 30 years twice. They will do the same again. So uh, are we Ethiopians um, a divided society as opposed to a diverse society? Do we, have, do we have a common future? I think all of our problems have not been resolved. Ethiopia was a country that was created by force through conquests and created a two-tiered uh, system in which some were enjoying the fruits of being citizens and the others were subjects. The struggle of the last 50 years was to make the subjects citizens. That was the, the goal. 
that they, as individuals uh, or, or citizens in, the, in a country, they enjoy all the, the rights that humans deserve because they are humans. But there is also that question of nationalities in the country that had to be resolved because people were subjected or rendered subjects, not because as just as individuals, but as nations, because they were different, because, because they were um, excluded from power, from self-government, from enjoying uh, the fruits of the, uh, the endowments of the country. That's, that's, that's the, the difference. So uh, Ethiopia is divided, all nations are divided in terms of their political outlook. That's why you have political parties. That's why you have the political parties with different visions. As I said at the beginning, the question is to have a social contract in which the majority rules. So what Ethiopia needs is not that, but to capitalize on, to pounce on the idea that we are divided. Yes, we're different. There is diversity in the country and diversity of uh, of culture, language, religion, uh, and even political vision. What we don't have is a determination to make sure that we can harmonize these differences. The country, the country is diverse, there is no doubt about that. Divided in the sense of having different outlooks, but that's fine, that's healthy. But we need a social contract, a vision. That for me is in, is an, in the constitution to create a federation of the willing, a federation of the willing. Um, if we have that, we don't have the complicated problems in the country. I think it's not. I mean, all nations are divided. There is a divided heart uh, everywhere. But that's a matter of diversity rather than simply uh, disintegration. OK, uh, President Isaias uh, is on record saying that he wants to cleanse uh, what he calls the legacy of the Wayane from the horn and that it is in his interest to, to intervene in Ethiopia's affairs. What do you say to that? I don't say anything to President Isaias. Uh, I don't pay attention to what he says. The results of his 30 year reign is clear. Uh, the issue is, no, look, the issue is in that area, in that region. The idea that Ethiopia could also replicate what he had done to Eritrea. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't really think to pay attention to what President Isaiah says. Nobody should pay attention to um, uh, uh, the legacy of uh, a legacy of a dictator. Um, in Ethiopia too, there was some level of author authoritarian rule over the last fifty years. The, the promise of the constitution and the promise of a multinational feder federation was not fulfilled, and the demands of the last six years, or the last. Uh, uh, five or six years was that that the federation be democratized and the country uh, 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 convert its subjects to uh, citizens. That was what it is. And to 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 um, uh, to allow President Isaias uh, um, roam around the country and uh, uh, counsel uh, the the former prime minister to make Ethiopia Eritrea. I don't think we should even talk about that because we know what President Isaias is all about. Ask the citizens of Eritrea. And nowadays, there is so much overlapping interplay of international and domestic uh, factors, uh, leading some politicians to coin a word, intermestics, taking one word from each. Uh, how is this playing out in the horn? The, there's this fine line between international and domestic affairs. How is Ethiopia influencing politics in the region and vice versa? In the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia is, um, is a large country. It's um, geographically and demographically, and its influence would be considerable if you can wield it with um, knowledge, with experience and foresight and uh, strategic uh, vision that's missing uh, look Ethiopia doesn't have uh, a national interest uh, Ethiopia's national interest is not defined Ethiopia's uh, national security policy is not is about 18 years old um, the relationships that were created in the Horn of Africa over the last 30 years that is like EGAD like the Nile Basin uh, initiative 
where decisions were made collectively, and Ethiopia had that great influence in working together with uh, the people of the countries of the Horn of Africa. That has com- waned uh, considerably over the last uh, over the last two years uh, because of the incoherent uh, vision that Ethiopia pre- uh, projects. Um, remember, remember once that the prime minister presented the conflict in Yemen as if it was a civil war between Yemenis and not uh, Saudi intervention, simply to please to please the Saudis. Ethiopia is Ethiopia's influence would be great if it works with its neighbors. But it's not working with its neighbors. All of those cooperative institutions were undermined and degraded uh, by uh, by Mr. Uh, Abiy Ahmed. So Ethiopia's influence has waned. Uh, Ethiopia does not even, uh, under Abiy, does not even re- uh, command the respect of the countries of the Horn because of the incoherence, uh, because of the, the self-centeredness, uh, because of the lack of knowledge of geopolitics. The way that for the country's foreign policy is, is conducted is on individual and ad hoc, uh, ad hoc basis. We don't conduct foreign policy that way because interests of countries, they change all, all, all the time, but a country needs to look at uh, foreign policy from the perspective of a doctrine, a doctrine that defines the national interest of the country. And you look at at the interest of other countries through that, that prism. We don't have that in that situation because of this uh, discombobulated vision and practice in, in, in Ethiopia. There's no uh, respect for for for, uh, for Ethiopia, but the potential still there under uh, an acute, uh, an astute and, and wise leadership. The potential is there, but not under um, Mr. Abi. Uh, professor, this is my last question. What do you think is the role of the international community uh, at present and h- how should it be involved in trying to help uh, Ethiopia uh, be on its feet? The current trajectory of the country is unsustainable. We do not want a dictator. Uh, we do not want a monarch. We do not want um, a unitarist state. We have tried those and left them uh, to history 30 years ago, or even <laughs> or 45 or so years ago when the emperor uh, uh, was deposed. Uh, it's unsustainable. And as I said, if if this current um, um, uh, uh, the current trajectory continues, the country is in for a calamitous political implosion, and that would have reverberations across the Horn of Africa. The international community does not need does not need uh, another political uh, implosion and the consequences thereof in the Horn of Africa. The international community should be advised about this, not to treat the after effects of uh, a, a political uh, implosion, but to to prevent it from happening. And it is possible to do it. So the role of the international community is that that they have a responsibility. To, to ensure that international norms are respected. Uh, they have the, the, uh, the international community has this responsibility to make sure that only elected governments could assume power and wield power. People who smother their, their own people, who do not respond to their needs, this is the thing of the past. That's not a, a, in accordance with the international norms not even in Africa itself. Um, only governments that are elected are recognized by the international community. Government, governments that do not respect, and this is really important, respect, respect human rights should not be tolerated. In the past 50 years, or maybe not uh, between 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, was uh, 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 issued, in the end of the Cold War, about 169 pe- million people were killed in the world, of which 45 million uh, were killed were political murders, killed by their own governments. And respecting human rights, and this is for the international community, respecting human rights is not a question of respecting individual rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted as a peace document. 
based on the philosophy or the assumption that free people uh, uh, are, are, are not going to fight. Democratic countries are not going to fight. So in order to protect and prevent a, a, a general war from uh, occurring, human rights must be respected. That's why we have a proliferation of instruments of human rights. This is about peace. This is about um, um, the architecture of preventing a calamitous war. That's what human rights are all about. Mr. Abi has shown that he does not respect human rights. He has flaunted the Constitution. He has dis dismantled the Ethiopian Federation that held the country together. This is unsustainable. So a, 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 a government that does not respect the human rights of the people, the expressed will of the people, is, 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 likely, is likely to face severe opposition. And that opposition, if they continue in this trajectory, is, as I said repeatedly, that is going to lead to a collapse. There's no doubt about that. So the, the international community has the responsibility to make sure that governments and the government in Ethiopia lives up to the expectation and norms of the international norms that belong to this era, not the, 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 the medieval period of uh, monarchy. So it's, it's, it has a, a huge responsibility, not just for the Ethiopian people, but to maintain peace in the region, in a very fragile region of, uh, of Africa. Professor Eskel Gebisa, thank you very much for this interesting conversation and analytical uh, reflections. Well, we have come to the end of the interview and this is goodbye from me.